Uh, Father in heaven, we thank you for our time uh, this afternoon uh, as we take a look at a couple of different things uh, with the book of Acts and um, some uh, parts that uh, we'll be uh, dealing with uh, even in the sermon. Uh, Lord, we pray that uh, uh, help us understand more fully uh, this aspect of holy ones, of saints, uh, as well as Paul's uh, blindness uh, in understanding that uh, more fully. Uh, we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so as I uh, prayed just now, we're going to look at a couple of different things. Uh, so sort of uh, 15 minutes, 15 minutes on two different topics that, that we're kind of covering uh, in the sermon, but we're not quite going to uh, deal with. Uh, so the first one is, if you take a look with me at Acts chapter 9, uh, let's turn over to Acts chapter 9, and I'm going to start with verse 10, and we're going to read through verse 15. Uh, I'm not really going to be addressing this at all uh, during the sermon, and so I just wanted to uh, make note of it and just sort of uh, tackle it a little bit here, because uh, I think it, it kind of helps us to understand what Ananias is doing here as well. Okay, so, uh, Acts chapter 9, and starting with verse 10. Acts chapter 9, starting with verse 10. Uh, now, there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Okay. Uh, so just taking a look at this, uh, we'll, we'll just to sort of address this. Uh, notice what Ananias, first off, uh, Ananias, does this name sound familiar? Hopefully it does. Not the same guy. <laughs> Not the same guy. How can we be sure? Be because the Ananias in, in Acts 5 is dead. Right? So this is a different Ananias. Okay? But uh, obviously, uh, this is the second of three times we see the name Ananias. Uh, there's going to be a third time Ananias is going to show up. He's a high priest. He's a high priest. Okay, the Jewish high priest. So he's going to show up uh, later on uh, in Acts. So this is the second of three Ananiases. And with this Ananias, I want you to notice something that he says here in verse 14. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your, na call on your name. Oh, no, no, sorry, 13. Uh, but Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And it's that word saints that I wanted to kind of explore a little bit for a few minutes uh, before we move on to uh, Paul and his blindness. Uh, this, this language of, of, of saints, the fact that he says saints, what does the term saints mean? Because we have an understanding of the word saints in terms of our vernacular in today's culture. Uh, typically, when we hear saints, what do we think? Especially given a couple weeks ago. What happened a couple weeks ago? Yeah, for us it might not be so, but but All Saints Day, which is November first, and the day before that is Halloween, uh, Hallow Eve, right? Right, the, the day before All Saints Day, right? It's a Roman Catholic tradition, uh, and so typically when we hear the word saint, what we're doing is we're thinking, oh, Roman Catholicism, right? We're thinking Roman Catholicism and saints, uh, and, and typically what is a saint in Roman Catholic tradition? Okay, so a saint would be someone that's like a super Christian. Well, just a very easy way to put it, right? Uh, the ability to do certain things, you know, above and beyond um, any mere regular Christian, you know, Joe Schmoes like you and me. Um, with the saints, actually, what uh, so Saint uh, uh, who is it? Uh, John Paul, John, not John Paul, Pope John Paul. I think he recently became like not knighted but sainted. Um, and part of that was you had to have a vision and you had to be able to do miracles, uh, th things of that sort. Um, but 
Saints is actually, you know, if, if, if we kind of take out our cultural kind of biases of that, you know, just take all that out. And when we think, what does the term saint actually mean? It simply means, literally, and, and those of you who have done membership should be able to answer this. But you might not still. Sanctification. Not, not sanctification, but, but when we say saint, it literally, what, what's the word? Literally, the word is just simply good. Good? <laughs> No, not, not good. Holy. Someone who's ho- a, a holy one. And, and what's interesting is that that word is pluralized. Holy ones. Okay, And so it's a phrase that we find in Scripture. Holy ones. Uh, so for instance, let's uh, take a look at Deuteronomy 33. Let's, let's go over to there. Deuteronomy 33. There's something fascinating about Deuteronomy 33 here. Looking at verses 2 and 3. This is Moses' final blessing. That's, that's what uh, chapter 33 is about, right before they're about to enter into the land. Um, so with Moses giving final blessings to Israel, Deuteronomy 33, I'm going to start with verse 1. Uh, this is the blessing with which Moses, the man of God, blessed the people of Israel before his death. He said, the Lord came from Sinai and dawned from Seir upon us. He shone forth from Mount Paran. He came from the ten thousands of holy ones with flaming fire at his right hand. Yet he loved his people. All his holy ones were in his hand. So they followed in your steps, receiving direction from you. Now, this holy ones. Yahweh, right, God, is there in verse 2. How many times do we see this holy ones? How many times do we see holy ones come up here? Because that word holy ones in the ESV there in verse 2 and 3, hint, hint, is actually the word that we, we use for saints. Do you see that? In verse 2, let me read that again. Are you guys at Deuteronomy 33? I, I said that, right? Okay. Deuteronomy 33, verse 2. Notice, the Lord came from Sinai and dawned from Seir upon us. He shone forth from Mount Paran, he came from the ten thousands of holy ones with flaming fire at his right hand. Who are these holy ones? Who are these holy ones? Who, is, who, who has these flaming swords? Ah, angels. And so we see these spiritual figures, these uh, angelic figures, described actually as holy ones. But then when we get to verse 3, yes, he loved his people, all his holy ones were in his hand. And yet holy ones also describing his people on earth. Uh, And so here we have uh, God describing himself with with these holy ones, these angelic figures on, uh, really this is a description of Mount Sinai. Moses telling the people at at the scene at Mount Sinai, uh, Yahweh is there with his holy ones, right? With all of his holy ones. Uh, the, these these essentially the same word we use for saints. And so these angelic figures with God. And, and what is it describing God upon Mount Sinai as he's, as he's uh, giving the law to Moses? Remember on Mount Sinai, it was just God, his angels, and uh, Moses. Moses was, was the guy that was there receiving the law. And so Moses then becomes this mediator to give the law to uh, God's people. And part of what I want you to see here is, is God with his holy ones, with these angelic figures. And it's, it's what we might describe as a, a, a great big council room. God in a great big council room as he's now giving to Moses his law. And his people are also described in a way where uh, the the saints language as as a people who have access to God. Now, now, your your hand is like, okay, what do we mean by this? Well, think about probably a classic example. Well, I'm thinking of two. When you think about the president. Not necessarily the current one, but just a president or even a prime minister. What does the prime minister, what does the president usually have with him or her? Margaret Thatcher, the German one, prime minister. What do they usually have? 
A lot, I mean, are, are they just kind of ruling on their own? Because even if you're a king or a queen, you still have what? Laws. Sorry? Laws. Oh, not, not, not laws, but, but sorry. It's, um, advisors. advisors. Oh, yeah. You have advisors. You have a council of people along with you. And during this sort of council, you know, it, it, we, we've talked about this in the past. This sort of council, God has his council. Another classic example would be uh, when you think of King Arthur and the what of the round table? The Knights of the Round Table. And his closest advisor was, was it Merlin? Lancelot. Lancelot, right? Lancelot ultimately winds up betraying him. But, but you have King Arthur and Lancelot, you know, the Knights of the Round Table. You have the president, the prime minister with his advisors. And part of what we're seeing here is God, when he describes his holy ones, a description of God himself, a quality of God himself, he says upon these people, he's saying that you along are, are my advisors, so to speak. It's quite an honor. And you have it in the spiritual realm, but you also have this, almost in a sense, an invitation of God's people to be a part of that. To be sort of like this, these advisors of God. Now we see this particularly with what kind of people um, in the Old Testament of his people. They have a, there's a specific sort of people that have the kind of access to God that you would never imagine. And we, we, we've talked about this in the past. Prophets. Prophets are actually invited, they're called by God, brought into his very presence. And, and what do prophets get to do with God? They get to talk with God. Now, is it just, yes, sir, God, no, sir, God? Is, is, is that all they get to do? They get to have a full-on conversation. But in that conversation, what do they get to do? Do they just say, whatever you say, sir? They argue. They argue. I want you to really think about what that means. They get to argue with God. God does not strike them down as soon as they push back on something that God says. Do they, does, does, does God, immediately, you know what? I don't need to deal with this. And they're gone. Does he destroy them right then and there? He doesn't do that. He allows them to push back. He allows them to kind of say, wait, wait, God, I'm, I, I don't agree with this. I don't agree with this. And that was the case with Moses because God says, you know what, I'm sick and tired of the Israelites. I'm tired of these people. And you know what, Moses, you and me, let's start a new nation. I will start a new nation through you. Forget the Israelites. And what does Moses say? No, 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 God. How can you even think of this? Blot me out instead. Right? Moses goes as far as to say, blot me out instead. And, and God says, okay, you know what? Never mind then. And yet, we're, we're, we're seeing this dialoguing conversation with God's holy ones. People who have his attribute, people who have his quality, that, that holiness. Something that his people are given. And ultimately we see that with the prophets. The prophets have this, this sort of very exclusive entry access to God where they can argue with God in such a way that was never seen before, right? It, 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 it's really wild. Because again, when you think about, just generally speaking, in, in, in the world at large, and you think about religions in the world, what religion describes their people, the people that follow that religion, the ability to argue with their deity? What religion allows that? There is no religion that allows... For their followers, their subjects of that deity to argue, to dialogue, to have that kind of wrestling with their divine figure. No religion allows for that. You either follow the religion, and, and, and actually there is a religion that simply means submitting to the will of God. What religion is that? Islam. You just simply submit. You don't argue. You, you, you don't have any kind of relation. No, you just simply submit. and You better listen. That's it. Here, though, a biblical religion describes the ability of God's people as holy ones having that kind of push and pull with God, that kind of conversation and dialogue that allows them 
to be in this kind of back and forth with him. Right? It, it's not simply saying, yes, sir, whatever you say, sir, and then you move on. So when we see this, when we see God's people having that kind of relationship with God, where they're actually allowed to have that push and pull with God, when we come to the New Testament and we see particularly with Pentecost, and I want you guys to understand why Pentecost is significant in this way as well. Why is Pentecost so significant? Because the Spirit of God has been given to not just a group of people like the prophets, but the Spirit of God has been given to all of God's people. All of God's people have been given this blessing of the Spirit that allows them not just simply entrance, access to God, Right? In one way, we can describe God's people have entrance and access to God. Right? This prophetic kind of a blessing right? in the spirit that you can go to God. And, and we can sort of emphasize that part of it. But there's another part, especially in light of last week, where God's people are given entrance in a way where they can push and pull with God. There's pushback with God. And when you see Ananias... Okay, we're we're going to cover this next week, actually. When we see Ananias, what does God tell Ananias to do? Let's go back to that. Going back to uh, Acts. Uh, Acts chapter 9. What does he tell Ananias to do with, with verse 11? And the Lord said to him, rise you know, and go to the street called Straight, house of Judas, look for a man. Uh, of Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he is praying and he has seen a vision. A man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him that he might regain his sight. Get up and go to that guy, Saul of Tarsus. Now, we don't see Ananias, yes, sir, and then go. What does he do? What does verse, 14, uh, verse 13 say? Lord. I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to you, to your saints at Jerusalem. Now remember, he's in Damascus. Damascus is the outskirts of Israel. Um, it's not quite Nazareth, the way you might say like the armpit of, of Israel, but Damascus ain't all that great either. Okay, Damascus is like on the outskirts. It's like as far, as, 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 you know, as far away a part of the promised land as you can kind of get to. And he's saying, look, look at what's happening here. What's happened at Jerusalem, what's about to happen here at Damascus. And you want me to go to him? No, I'm going to flesh this out more next week. But, I mean, essentially what Ananias is saying, are you nuts? He's come to Damascus to kill people, to drag Christians away, to imprison them. And you want me to now go to him? Are you nuts? This is insane. Again, for Ananias to push back a bit on God's command to get up and go, to allow, for Ananias to be able to do something like that, is, is, I want you to kind of appreciate the, the, the sense of, of, of what really puts apart Christianity here. That allows Christians to, in a sense, have this dialogue with God and say, wait a minute, I don't understand here. I don't understand what's going on. This doesn't make sense. Now, ultimately, we see Ananias obey. Right? In the next couple of verses, he obeys. But there is a sense, again, I, I want you to be able to uh, uh, appreciate that Ananias isn't just blindly, right? he's not just blindly saying, okay, whatever you say, God, but appreciate that there's a sense of, of pushing back and being able to dialogue with God. And again, that's exactly what the Old Testament saints do all the time where you see them, them sort of uh, concerned, and then the prophet, or not the same, but the prophets particularly, who push back and say, no, God, this is not the way it should be, Lord. And then you see God actually relent. And, and, and this is where we could bring in those languages where God is described as changing his mind. It's not that God actually changes his mind, but it's a way to communicate to us that God is interacting with our desires. And, and what did we ultimately see for ourselves, right? When we talk about for ourselves, this, this aspect of being able to dialogue with God, to be able to push back on, on things we don't understand, and we're saying, God, why? How long? 
We don't understand certain things here. And we're asking God and we're pleading with God. And it seems like this is the way it's going to be. And then suddenly, after we pray, it pivots in a different direction. And we begin to see God is actually answering prayer. God is actually allowing us to push back. God is allowing us to say, hey, God, I don't understand this. This is what I'm asking. Um, And and we're bringing these requests. We're we're, uh, presenting all these things before the Lord. And the Lord is hearing that. And he's willing to engage with you in that dialogue which is a big thing about prayer, right? Prayer is not just simply having a simple, oh, Lord, and and, and we see this particularly with with, uh, Saul as a Pharisee, the kind of prayers that he would have done. And he prayed a lot. And yet the kind of prayer that we're going to see him do, um, the kind of praying that he's involved in now is going to be very different. And, and, And we'll get into that with the sermon. But we have to be able to understand that that This sort of privilege as Christians, as holy ones, the fact that you are saints. Paul, in Ephesians 1, addresses all of the whole church as saints. From the youngest to the oldest. Now, the youngest one here would be Noah and Ezra. They have the privilege of being able to address the Lord. And that's something that we ought not to um, take for granted. And seeing they get to actually address the Lord whatever limited capacities that they may have, right? As, as kids under one-ish. And, and that's something that I want us to be, again, if, if they have, if, if they are being called saints, if, if Paul in Ephesians 1 is calling them saints, he's calling all of you saints, he's calling all of you as people who have the privilege to dialogue with God, to be able to say, I don't understand this. Help me to understand this. I desire this, this, Lord, you are a good God, but what's going on here, I don't get. We are allowed to bring all of these things before him. And he's saying, I want to hear all of that. The worst thing is, is, is again, um, you know, is, 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 is um, sometimes in life, uh, the worst thing is when someone kind of hides something from you, doesn't want to say anything to you, right? Um, you know, I, I, like, like that's something I'm, I'm constantly trying to tell Joshua with, with you know, tell me. Because you'd be surprised. I already know what, 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 what actually is going on. But I want you to tell me because part of it, I want you to be able to uh, come to me and, and be upfront and, and, and open rather than hiding things. And so often when it comes to our relationship with God, we want to hide things. And part of it, again, is, is when we think about that relationship with God, why is it that we hide things? Why is it that we don't want to be open? Even though God, time and time again, says, I already know everything. Clearly, we know he's a sovereign God. He knows, but why is it that we only want to bring certain sort of requests to the Lord? Why is it that sometimes we'll only talk to him in certain ways? And and, and it seems, and, and this is something to consider, is it because there are times in which we want to appear before God sort of in a prim and proper way? That we want to uh, have a certain appearance before God. That we want to ad- address God as if to say, hey, Lord, look at how I am. I'm good enough and therefore hear me. And only when I come to God in, in a certain prim and proper way and, and thinking that only now God is going to hear me. And that whole approach to God becomes, again, something that I've been saying over and over again, a very, very performance-based approach to the Lord. And we don't understand grace. Grace is saying that, Lord, I'm a wreck. I'm a mess. I'm I'm coming before you. And I'm bringing, I don't get certain things that are happening. Rather than simply coming before the Lord and and, and saying only certain things and, and, and trying to appear right. Right based upon how I am. So we, we see, again, the Lord in, in allowing Ananias to push back. It's not, it wasn't wrong of Ananias. It was actually permitted. And the Lord does not strike him down in judgment of sin, but rather dialogues with Ananias. And ultimately, Ananias is convinced and goes. Right? Not this unwavering faith. Oh, here we go. He's actually scared. Wouldn't you be if 
Someone like Paul? You're supposed to go to Paul? Someone or Saul of Tarsus? I mean, I'd, I'd be freaked out of my mind. Like, are you kidding me? And yet, he ultimately does go. So I, I want you, to, again, to be able to appreciate a, a sort of, um, it, we've been talking about this over and over again, but I'm adding more and more layers, and hopefully you're, you're seeing and being able to appreciate further th- this whole notion of being able to pray to God, of dialoguing with God. This is not three times a day praying, you know, breakfast, lunch, and then dinner, and then maybe, maybe a fourth time right before I go to bed, right? Um, you know, and, and, and rub-a-dub, grub, you know, thanks, rub, thanks for the grub, um, you know, and then, you know, amen, or, or God is good, God is great, and, and you know, and just sort of these sort of, um, sort of prayers that, that, that don't uh, have any real substance, perhaps. Um, not, not to say it's wrong to teach that, right? I, I don't want to say that, no, don't do that. Um, but it's this idea that uh, oftentimes people will pray, you know, because we do the Lord's Prayer every Sunday, in fact, right? There's, there's nothing wrong with, with having pre-written, nuanced prayers, you know, written prayers, and, and saying it, you know, on a day-to-day basis. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. However, when that becomes your entire prayer life, that's where I want you to be careful, or that becomes your entire dialogue with God, just scripted, and that's all you ever say with him, rather than coming before him and being able to bring everything out to him. He knows it. He wants to hear it. And so rather than trying to, again, keep the facade and pray only in a certain way, prim and proper, and that might make him hear, we're saying, Lord, here's everything, and there's nothing hidden. And hopefully we're seeing that a little bit with this Holy Ones. Now, we didn't get to Paul and his blindness, uh, we'll, we'll try and get to that, not next week, because we'll be in prayer next week, but uh, the week after. Um, we'll be kind of moving along a little bit, but I'm going to get back to this whole idea of Paul and his blindness, because um, with him being blind, that's something that Moses actually prophesies about Israel being blind. Right? We, we see that with Isaiah, but um, what's interesting, Moses actually says being blind in midday, in the middle of the day. And when you think about Paul, when is he blind? It's not at night. He's blind literally in the middle of the afternoon. Right? And so uh, Moses kind of speaks to this and, and, and kind of uh, helps us to understand a little bit further uh, Paul's mission as a, uh, as a missionary to the Gentiles a little bit more with this light and darkness aspect as well. So uh, we'll kind of uh, deal with that next time as well. Um, let's, uh, let's close in prayer. Uh, Father in heaven, we thank you that once again uh, we're reminded of, of your your mercy and your grace that you would um, give us the kind of privilege of, of dialoguing with you, but dialoguing in a way where um, is, is so distinct from anything else uh, that this world has seen, so distinct from any religion that this world has ever seen, made, um, created. Uh, Lord, the kind of dialogue that we have with you is one where it is honest, it is brutally honest at times, uh, times where we don't understand, times in which we'll come before the Lord and, and uh, lay out everything before you, uh, and you hear them. Uh, you don't strike us down in judgment, you don't strike us down in, in uh, your wrath, but rather in Jesus Christ there is now no condemnation. And so we come before you, as Jesus himself had prayed, uh, our Father, we come before you with that basis. You are our Father, and we thank you that you hear us, and that you, you, you want to hear us, um, you desire to hear us. You desire for us to give everything, to say everything before you. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.